traditional religious garb, holy hats, magic underwear, and three-piece suits. Now this introduction might touch some folks on the raw, but one must admit that the traditional dress of some religious groups causes others to wonder what might be its purpose. We have those who wear special clothing identified with some form of respect of God. It's a symbol of piety for the Jew who wears the kippah or yarmulke on his head. And the Muslim might wear a skull cap or kufi. Others in the Middle East might wear an Arab style headscarf or a kafia which actually has a practical application as well because it can be wrapped around the face for protection against blowing desert sand. The Amish or German Baptist might wear head covering that's part of their identity. The question that one might ask is, is this for humility, simplicity, or a statement of non-conformity against society? Well, whatever the case, it certainly draws attention to themselves as much as a woman with a load of tattoos does. And of course, we all like a little attention. Jesus had some interesting comments about religious folk who liked attention. Quote, They do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. That's out of Matthew 23, verse 5. Now, Mormons have a slightly different approach. Their young elders, I'm not sure how we can put young and elder in the same sentence, but they do. They peddle their wild story dressed in white shirts and ties, much like a door-to-door -door home security salesman. Now, John the Baptist wearing a camel skin cloak and eating bugs would have found this rather odd. We don't have to worry about washing the missionary's feet, however, because they are covered with nice, shiny black shoes. This is the Western business approach to hawking religion. If one visits the Mormon temple, you will likely see a whirl of activity with photographers shooting wedding couples amidst flower gardens with the temple as their backdrop. You're not likely to see such a thing at a Mormon church, however, because the temple ritual, or Sealing, as they call it, can only be done by someone who holds sealing authority. And the temple is where it must be held. This ritual supposedly seals the family relationship throughout eternity. Only Mormons with good standing may participate, and no non-Mormons are allowed. You non-Mormons are not worthy of such make-believe because you're simply not enlightened with such revelation. Now there's a difference between the standard until death do us part belief and the Mormon for time and eternity spin. The Mormon whose spouse has died may remarry and be sealed to spouse number two, three, or four as well. This might present a little tension in the hereafter, however, when they begin the work of making spirit babies. But for the Mormon, don't worry, be happy. So where do the Mormons get this temple marriage business? Well, it's not from the Bible, that's for sure. But it appeals to people who are insecure about the afterlife. In the Gospel of Matthew, we can read where Jesus was being taunted by some Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. And they presented a story about a woman who was married to a guy who died. She then married one of his seven brothers. After outliving each of these brothers, being married to each of them in turn, she also died. They challenged him, In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her. And Jesus answered them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, or the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And that's in Matthew 22, verse 23 through 30. Now the Mormons are good at stroking the emotions of people regarding this whole family in heaven story, and they put on quite a show of it in television commercials. The unity of the family is a healthy one on the surface. However, the Mormons have a far deeper theological spin on it, 
which includes having sex in heaven and populating their own planet of spirit children. They even sing hymns that include such ideas as having a heavenly mother as well as a father. The hymn, O oh My Father, by Eliza R. Snow, written in 1843 during the days of Joseph Smith, reads, In the heavens are parents single? No, the thought makes reason stare. Truth is reason, truth is eternal, tells me I have a mother there. When I leave this frail existence, when I lay this mortal by, Father, Mother, may I meet you in your royal courts on high. This celestial parentage doctrine is recorded clearly in McConkie's book Mormon Doctrine on page 516, where he refers to Doctrine and Covenants 132 verses 19 through 32, as well as page 129 of Man, His Origin and Destiny in a formal proclamation of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve. In Mormonism, man is not created, but born, the offspring of celestial parents. Going till I got to here They kept telling me it'll work out No reason to fear Just lean into it, they say Eventually it'll pay But my back is so tired There's no place to lay And it's clear now Yes, it's clear now You're the one You're the one 